So I would give those tenants a break and not raise their rent, but every couple years, three years, I would raise it a small amount of money. So they always knew that eventually they were gonna be, they were gonna stay under market because I always wanted to, them. And I rewarded them for paying on time and being, you know, not asking for anything. Uh, but they also knew that I took care of problems, I fixed stuff, they weren't, they weren't gonna have like mice in their apartment or, you know, faucets, you know, breaking and stuff like that, I would fix it. So, multifamily prices. You guys all are interested in multifamilies and rental income. Is anybody here that is only interested in wholesaling or flipping? That's no. you. Okay, well you'll change your mind. <laughs> um, I, I sell wholesaler, you sold one. Yeah? Right, Ike? Yes, yeah. Good for you. Thank you. So are you interested in multifamily? Yeah. Okay, all right, see, he already knows. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with doing both. It just takes a lot more time and effort. Um, so multifamily prices are a function of NOI. Does anybody here, do you guys know what NOI is? Some of you are nodding and some of you are knowing. All right, I'm gonna talk about NOI. That's net operating income. And roughly speaking, net operating income is the income minus the expenses without taking into account the mortgage interest or the mortgage principal pay down, okay? And that net operating income determines what a property is worth. I'm not gonna go into detail on that because that's a whole presentation on what's NOI. I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Um, but that net operating income determines what your property is worth, both to an appraiser and to a bank, okay? Uh, and, and it's going to to you also, all right? So since the price of the property is a function of the net operating income, and the net operating income is a function starting with the rents and then the expenses. The lower your rents, the lower your property is worth. Does everybody get that? Okay, you probably already did that. Okay, so that starts with the rents. So I didn't raise the rents and then I sold this building. Well, have any of you ever talked to her, looked at a property where it's advertised, you know, rents are below market and here's the pro forma and it can make this much money. But they want you to raise those rents after you buy it, right? So Josh and John will say never buy it on pro forma, what the rents could be, always buy it on what the rents are, okay? Well, in this market where everything's so crazy, People are buying houses on pro forma every day. So not buying a house on pro forma doesn't work because somebody else will pay that much money. So, um, but normally in a normal market, which is right around the corner, we already know that, right? Right around the corner, normal market. Um, so I started selling my properties off in 2019, I think. The reason is not because real estate's bad, don't misunderstand. But I was estimating that we were due for a market top in 2020, cyclically. It's been every 14 years, according to Case Schiller and all that kind of stuff. So the next market top after 2020 was going to be 14 plus 2020 is 2034. I'm not gonna tell you how old I will be in 2034, <laughs> but I won't want rental properties. So I said, okay, I'm still lending. I'm active in lending. I don't need my rentals. I know you're supposed to keep them forever. By the way, the wealthiest families never sell anything. Plenty of people sell stuff, but the wealthiest families never sell anything. I said, okay, I don't want rental properties anymore. I want to do less work. I want to work towards retirement. I want to do less stuff. Something's got to give. Do I give up lending or do I give up real estate? Oh, I'm a control freak. I micromanage everything to death, okay? So what am I gonna give up? I'm gonna give up the thing that I could never turn over to a property manager, sorry. Because I never found a good one, obviously. <laughs> so I had to manage all my own properties. So 
I said, all right, I'm going to give up my real estate. And so I sold all my property. Not because I don't believe in real estate, so don't misunderstand me, because there's plenty of money still to be made. So as a result of this, just one, just a few properties that I was selling in 2019 to 2021 cost me like 200 grand from not raising the rent on a regular basis. That's usually a lesson that you have to learn on your own. People can tell you, always raise the rents every year. You're not gonna believe them. You're gonna say, oh, no, I don't have to do that because Nancy's been there for 12 years and she's such a good tenant, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have you made this mistake, Jim? Those last 10 years? <laughs> still doing it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm still on the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So raise it $5 a month so they get used to it. Raise once a year, do your increase, it can be $5. Or if the market goes down, and believe me, that does happen too. If you've been in real estate for a long time, the rents actually go down. I know, sounds unbelievable, but it can happen. Um, if the rents go down, adjust down so you can keep your good tenants. But make those increases, and you can have them slightly below market so that they still know that you're still slightly below market, like 25, 50 bucks. Make it not worth their while because it's expensive to move, but raise your damn rent, okay? All right. Then the bigger pocket calculator, they calculate about 2% of rent of the year. So you can see like 30 years from now, you'll be making some significant cash flow if you keep the rents. Because your mortgage, for the most part, your mortgage shouldn't change if you get a fixed mortgage. Right? Well, if you, you get, get commercial, it will. Get fixed, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, just keeping that spread going is going to be beneficial to you. Right, but just in perspective, my I work for a publicly traded real estate investment trust, and on average, we went up about 20% year over year on rent. And if you weren't going the 2% every couple of years, that would have been 30% increase. Right, and so. then your tenants get pissed and they move just yes. just because they're pissed. Yeah. But there was a there was a pause with the COVID stuff Yeah. where rents kind of did a, a right. weird limbo. And right, because everybody became, was afraid that exactly. the market was going to tank. And as we came out of that, supply started screaming. So everyone started pushing rents at a much, much right. higher rate than normal. And faster than that you could actually push them on. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, yeah. So, but raise your rents, stay on top of it, put it on your calendar, do an assessment every year, do whatever you've got to do, don't be lazy. Even if you're in a W-2, raise your damn rents, okay? <laughs> if, I, if I teach you nothing else, raise your rents. Because they won't appreciate that you didn't raise them. You know, I mean, they'll be like, because they still think it's too much. I mean, they'll, they'll know that you haven't had many increases. They don't realize how far below market they are. They never do until they go to bed, okay? All right. Um, anybody ever buy out of state? Anybody here buy out of state? Did you see the property? I don't mean out of state like Massachusetts. I mean out of the area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I buy in Texas and Florida. So I have apartments down there. Okay. So you're probably going to disagree with everything I said. But again, this is my <laughs> mistake. <laughs> this is my mistake for my circumstances, my bandwidth, and my skill set. Okay. So, um, can we take a break while everybody gets food? No, we're just about, it's all already out now. Okay. Um, so, I decided that since I was visiting friends in South Carolina, Aiken, South Carolina is right next to Augusta, Georgia. And in South Carolina and Georgia and most of the South, rents are lower, costs are lower, real estate values are lower. There are high percentages of tenants relative to the cost of the house. So we're here, people go, Gee, it's cheaper to buy. Why don't they just buy the house? There are parts of the country where it's just in the DNA to rent, okay? And this particular city, Augusta, seemed to be a big rental city. So this is in Augusta, which is where the Masters is, but it's also 10 miles from Aiken, where I was staying several times. 
So I attended a RIA with the Real Estate Investor Association, and I met this guy who had a brokerage, and he was also managing property. He was also managing the rehab for the real estate investor, and he was also managing the property afterwards. And I liked what he had to say. I was confident in him. And that confidence, confidence has never been dispelled, by the way. I am not bad-mouthing him um, at all. Um, but uh, so I decided to take the jump. And this is the house I bought first. So this is a picture of the inside. It's a pretty bad picture. The reason that picture is so bad is that I never saw the house. So what I did with the real estate company, I drove the neighborhoods, determined what I was comfortable with, how bad of a neighborhood or how good of a neighborhood I was comfortable with. Because the better the neighborhood, the lower your cash flow. The, hot, the worse the neighborhood, the higher the cash flow, section eight, etc. So I, they got comfortable with my level of risk. I got comfortable with them. So then when I came home, they sent me properties until I found my first one to buy. So I bought that property without visiting. It was cash only transaction. It's very difficult to get a mortgage for a $60,000 house when you don't live in the state. So don't try. <laughs> um, but it was a typical three, one and a half thousand square feet. They did a rehab for 17 grand. Now I looked it up to see how long ago that was just for perspective on 17 grand. And it was 2014. So that was eight years ago. So significantly a while ago, but not like 1996, okay? Things were just cheaper. Everything was cheaper. You could buy a free one in Augusta for 60 grand. And it wasn't in that bad of shape, because as you can see, that's not horrible. We've seen much worse than that. So, um, all right, so we did the rehab. They got me a tenant. He was a truck driver, single guy with a Yorkshire Terrier. What's not to like, right? So eight ninety five a month was my rent. That was they moved in. It was August. Suddenly, I had five tenants. None of them were Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> okay, so I had five tenants in this three bedroom house. I think they paid the first month. I think that's it. And I had, they were evicted by January of the following year, okay? So then a new HVAC system and repairs cost me $6,000. Why, when I just had a full cosmetic rehab done, they told me that the furnace was old, but it was okay, all right? I said, so how come nobody told me about this? Because I was talking to the contractor directly. They didn't hire him for me. They connected me with him, I hired him. Worked with him over the phone. Guy was great. I'd use him again in a heartbeat. He said, no, the furnace is okay. You don't have to replace it. This was the okay air conditioning. Oh my goodness. I know, right? <laughs> so okay in one person's mind and okay in another person's mind is two different things, right? So here I am. I'm a micromanager. They tell me that I need $6,000. And by the way, it's a lot more expensive to do these repairs now for, with the property management company managing this because they add their percentage on, which they were upfront about, I'm okay with that. But this should have been done with the rehab. Had I realized, I would have done, done it all at one time. And I had a picture of the actual furnace in the closet too, which looked her with this. They sent me that afterwards. They also, did not put on the scope of work and things like broken screen door handles. Why would you not do that during a, during a rehab, right? Well, they didn't consider it important or whatever the criteria was, whatever. So right after the guy moves in, oh, I have a broken screen door handle, $125, really? <laughs> you know, compared to a rehab that just cost 17 for the full cosmetic. So, and I'm like, I think I'm not cut out for this because I'm like flipping out that this is the way it goes. Because I would have never got, I mean, that tenant probably would have never passed my screening, but it passed theirs. Yeah, so it so, was like all through the property manager company. Everything was through the property, the tenant, when everything was through, the, I mean, I had to approve it, but I didn't get to see everything, you know, so. So you're paying because of 
there? No, the whole pro so my mistake was that I didn't have my own person, boots on the ground. I bought it without seeing it. I didn't insist on seeing pictures of everything. I took their word for it. The contractor was great. He was great. He did what he was told. And he did it on a timely basis and I paid him and he and I are still Facebook friends and he says, Ann, I wish you were down here. I'd work with you in a heartbeat. And I feel the same way. The guy was great, but he only does what he's told. And remember that real estate company was giving him tons of work. So where are his priorities? He has to do what he's paid to do and what, you know. So it, there were lots of mistakes. I'm not suited to this. Because I, if I'm gonna let go, it better be for bigger than a $60,000 property. Because six, a one single family house is not big enough to, to, to so the scope of the project makes a big difference. So I, I have professional property yeah. management in a multifamily, like a 200 unit now, and I don't even think about it, yeah. okay? Because that's, in a big complex, that's what they're paid to do. They do a good job. It's always gonna be more expensive than if you, if you had only one job and your job was to manage that 200 unit complex, you would do a better job than somebody that was paid to do it, eventually, once you learn how to do it. Because it's your money. It's not their money. It's not their money. They're just, you know. I live in a condo now. I'm on the board. The property manager. She's a professional. She's a senior property manager. I I hate I, I don't like to tell her that I'm a better property manager. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, you should tell her. No. <laughs> that won't end well. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not the only board member. I don't own the condo complex. <laughs> so would you buy out of state again? I do own out of state right now. Okay. Estero, Florida. But it just had a hurricane. My parents used to have a place down there. They sold it a few years ago. They were in Texas now. Yeah, but it's a, it's a big condo. It's a big apartment complex. So it's on-site management. Um, I bought it through 1031. Um, I get checks deposited every month. Am I going to, and I can't, you know, it's a 10 year investment. So flipping out about the micromanagement doesn't make sense. On a single family that I'm self managing from a distance, oh, I can do well at that. <laughs> Pro professional property management of a 200 unit complex, it's PASCO. They're, you know, it's a big outfit. So it's, it's kind of a different thing. I also make hardly any money on it percentage wise, but it's part of my, the 1031 thing and retirement and all that kind of stuff. It, things are different every time. Um, okay, any questions about that part of it? So I sold the property, by the way, just so that you know. I sold the property. I think I had to pay for the air conditioning. I had, did put in the new uh, air conditioning system, new furnace. Uh, sold the property after we re-fluff and bucked it. And overall, took a $10,000 loss, just because I said, you know what? I'm not good at this. This isn't for me. I should do what I'm good at. Sometimes when you focus, like I make plenty of money in living, do what you're good at, you know? So. But to reframe, you took a $10,000 loss, or you took a $10,000 deduction? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> that but, that little terminology there is what stopped me from doing the first flip because I thought I was going to lose money. But realistically, if I did lose money on it, it would have been a deduction against future gains on it. Let me, let me think, about, this. Let me think about which entity I did it in. Because, um, no, you know why? Because I did it in a self-directed IRA, which is an inherited IRA. No, I took a $10,000 loss. That's a loss. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Sorry it didn't go that. against my regular. <laughs> it didn't go against my regular taxes or any of the other income or anything like that, because I don't even do tax returns for, for that right now. Yeah. So yeah, no, it was a loss. But you know what? Just like they say, I went to a seminar. I learned a lot. <laughs> okay. I learned what not to do. What's not right for me? Because I already knew how to manage property. I already knew how to do flips. I already knew how to manage a contractor. I already knew all that <laughs> stuff. I just didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do it from, you know, 1,800 miles away. That's not 
that's not a bad lesson, $10,000 no. lesson. Yeah. You can spend a lot more. My Thank other lessons lesson. cost me a lot more money. You know, so that's not terrible, Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. And remember, they say if you're not losing money on some, you're not doing enough deals. Yeah. Right? Because you're going to make bad decisions because you make mistakes. Okay. So, change gears a little bit. I was building spec houses, modular spec houses. I knew shit about this. I knew nothing about it. But, um, but that's all right, that never stopped me. So I buy the piece of land, I contract with the dealer slash contractor. He does both, he's a dealer and the general contractor. So what that means is you pick out a house, you contract with him, he gets it delivered, you show up, you give him a check for the house, and then he, you know, he does the foundation, he does all the site work, the well, the septic, all that kind of stuff. Um, I was definitely involved in the project, but I wasn't by any means out there every day, okay? Uh, I lived in, where did I live at the time? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Let's just say I lived in Nashua, and the house was in Greenfield. You guys know where Greenfield is out there, the state park out there, okay? So, um, and I, this was my, I don't remember if this is my first one or my second one. So anyway, um, so this was this was the setback line. That that bottom green line is the setback line. In Greenfield, the setback was like a thousand feet or something crazy like that. And because of the rocks and the trees and everything, the septic system was 45 degree angle to the house. So all the septic was all laid out and it was dug and everything like that and the foundation contractor comes in and apparently my general contractor had not staked out or had the engineer stake out where the foundation is supposed to go okay so the foundation contractor comes in and says oh well the septic system's right there didn't look at the plans one second here. Anybody want another drink at all? I'm getting a little bit of tears. Just shout it. Just shout, shout it. Out, yeah. Just shout it. Unless you're shy about it. I'll just say I can't it if you want. No, no, I'm not shy. I'm just going to put it on. Can I have a... Do um... you have a Mai Tai? Um, yeah, we have Mai Tai. Can I have Hulu and Pineapple? What was the first thing? Hey. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. huh? uh, very soda and it's delicious. Splash of crayons. Yeah. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. Sorry, Ian. No, no problem. Like I said, we're slowing it down so that we can have conversations. Um, so I, I think I said a thousand foot setback, but it was a hundred, but that's plenty. So you can see what happened. So when did I find this out? When the only thing that wasn't done in the house was the basement ceiling insulation. The house was completely done. It had been delivered. It had been buttoned up. You know, the pieces were put together. The siding was on. All the, the shower doors were in. Because in a modular house, there's a lot of work that has to be done inside. It, it doesn't come perfect ready to move in. Uh, the roof has to be lifted, then it, they have to do the shingles and all that kind of stuff. So I call my contractor and he stops returning my calls. <laughs> Typical. First red flag. Yeah. It should have been my like 32nd red flag, <laughs> but unfortunately it was my first red flag. So I called the building inspector and I said, um, this is Ann Bellamy, and I'm just checking to see why we're not getting our final inspection on blah, blah, blah address. And he says, oh, you're the owner? I said, yeah. I said, um, I haven't been able to reach my contractor, and I was just wondering what the holdup was. He said, well, you have a lot. I said, the uh, insulation isn't in, in, the, in the basement, and he says he can't put it in or something, and I, I, I was wondering what the problem was. He said, well, you've got a lot bigger problems than, than basement insulation. I said, I do? He says, yeah. 
your house is two feet over the setback line. I said, what? So he explained to me not why it went over the setback line, but what that meant. And I'm like, the blood is draining out of my face, you know. I, I, I think I'm sweating bullets and stuff like this, realizing that I now have spent whatever it was I spent to build this house, do the foundation, do the septic, do the well, do everything. The house is all done. And it's not saleable, I can't get a permit. Because you don't get a permit when you're over the setback line and they make you like redo it. Well, that wasn't gonna happen. So, just to make it worse, the well was less than 75 foot from the septic. Yeah, so I clearly was not involved enough in this house because the maximum, they have to be at least 75 feet away so that the septic doesn't leach into the water that you're about to drink, okay? And I just assumed everything was fine throughout this whole process because he kept telling me everything was fine. So I'm gonna go back to the house for a second. So what happened on this is I, went to my attorney. Anybody know Andy Sullivan? Good. He's a very good real estate attorney. He's very hard to get because he's busy. Um, but he's very, very good. And he said, did you know that the house was supposed to be, you know, 100 feet back? Yeah. Did the contractor know? Yeah. Okay. And he asked me a bunch more questions. I can't remember what all the criteria were. And he said, well, you qualify for an equitable waiver. I said, oh, awesome. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you don't have to go through the variance process. You qualify for an equitable waiver. So he explained to me that when you know what the rules are and through some weird thing, you screw it up, but you were trying to do the right thing. I don't remember what the exact terminology is. This happened. What? He gave me my gray hairs. So, uh, so he explained it all to me. And it would be cost prohibitive to fix the problem. Clearly moving an entire foundation is cost prohibitive. And then a third criteria, he says, you automatically qualify for an equitable waiver. I said, oh, great, what are we gonna do? So he files it with the town. So I have to go in front of the planning board. How many of you guys have been in front of the planning board? Okay. So in this little town, we get there at nine o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night or some ridiculous time at night when the planning board meets. And then they were a couple hours late because one of them had to go get an emergency refrigerator for one of his tenants. So it's like 10 o'clock. <laughs> and so we had the contractor there, we had the foundation contractor there, testified, yes, I knew it but there were no stakes in the ground, so I put the house where I thought it was supposed to go, blah, 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 blah. And um, then they, then you have to shut up and then they talk about you as if you're not there. <laughs> 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 that was horrifying, let me tell you. And so then they all talk about why I have enough money that they should teach me a lesson and oh, make wow. me move the house while I'm sitting there. <laughs> And you can't say a word, right? So, um, so then they voted, and they voted three to two for me to not move the house and grant the equitable waiver. Now, fast forward, they screwed with me on purpose. They all knew that they were gonna give me the waiver. I found out later through other sources, you know, it's all a small town. Found out later through other sources that they all knew they had to give me the waiver. They all knew I qualified for it, and they just did that on purpose so I'd be more careful later. Because really, 100 feet, what does two feet, three inches mean? So they were just messing with me. But thank God I had a good attorney that knew what they were doing, and he saved me, I don't know, whatever it would have cost. Back then, it was tens of thousands, and he only charged me whatever he charged me here. <laughs> so if they voted that you had to move it, I guess we would have appealed. Would have yeah, because Andy had told me we would appeal if they voted it because he said you clearly meet all the criteria. We'll have to appeal, 
and then you'll win an appeal, and I'm positive you'll win, but it'll still cost more money and legal fees, and so you it'd know, be a spike to, if they did. Yeah, yeah, and they knew it, and you know. So. Well, isn't, that, isn't that also part of how many inspections that the the city had done on the property, so that they were also a party to the fact that the property was not uh, built? Yeah, and this goes back to contract. So the biggest bane in a real estate investment life is a contractor, that's true. Are there any contractors in the room? Nobody would admit it now. <laughs> um, and the contractor knew all along. And I don't know why the building department didn't put a stop work order on it. That makes no sense to me. But it doesn't matter, there I was, you know? So um, I guess because the contractor probably wanted me to keep paying him because he didn't know how to deal with it. He had no idea because he didn't have Andy sold. You know, Andy's good. He knows his stuff. Okay, am I taking too long? Uh, if we're gonna go around the room, probably about like ten more minutes. We can go okay. on and go around the room. Um. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna go this one quickly. So, first eviction. I didn't do it by myself. I used Andy Sullivan because he said he used to sell a book that said how to do your first eviction, but always or how to do evictions on your own. He used to sell this book. He said, but always do the first one with the attorney so you can learn how to do it. Then you can do them on your own. They're not hard, which was amazing for an attorney because he didn't want to be doing evictions. Okay, so I hired the I hired him. He walked me through the process. We get to court. He says. Um, so one of these lessons is don't do on the cheap, pay the attorney. That's the lesson, okay? He says, Your Honor, he, went to, he pulled the tenant aside, and he says, listen, we'll give you another month in the house, just pay us $300. The tenant says, okay. I think, I don't know what the rent was, 600, 700, whatever. He said, give us $300, we'll let you have another month in the house. And they said, okay. So he says, Your Honor, we've come to an agreement with the tenant and they're going to pay $300 and we're going to give them another month to move out so that they can find a new place to move out. She says, she says, is that true? And everybody agreed. So we signed the agreements and we got the 300 bucks and blah, 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 blah. And he says, once you have that agreement, they cannot come back again. You can then go right to rid of possession and get them out. So or actually go right to the sheriff and get them out. So pay the attorney, learn how to do it properly. Don't try to do everything on your own without a real estate attorney in real estate. It doesn't pay, it pays to pay the attorney, okay? That's the lesson on this one. By the way, the tenant also stood up and said, Your Honor, I don't understand what the $65 extra charge is on there. And it was, I said, Your Honor, it was a $65 credit. They moved in on Christmas Day, and I gave them a day for free because it was Christmas. And the, and the judge, that was just a little, because the judge kind of smirked. <laughs> so. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What does that cost to an eviction with an attorney? Do the Nowadays, I haven't done one for a while. Who knows? I was just curious. How, how did they charge? Was it a retainer? Oh, how did he charge? Yeah. No, I'm asking how did he charge? Uh, was it hourly? <clears throat> It was hourly or flat fee, I don't remember. I've always done my own, so. Yeah. I think it's about 1500 bucks right now. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it was a lot cheaper back then. Right, right. But everything was cheaper. How much? 1000 to 2000 1000 to 2000 Flat fee. Yeah. And sometimes it depends if you have, if you're going to a larger firm, if you have a partner do it, it's going to be more money. If you can find some associates to do it, you can probably get it done for a grant. Right. But if you do it yourself, it doesn't cost anywhere near that. But the first time, yes. see, I went through this process with him, and I had his book on how to do it, and he taught me right there in the courtroom that it matters if you know what you're doing. He's like, you know, that now, now they could, I could get them out after the 30 days. So, um, okay, losing $150,000. So, some people talk about their attorneys as blood-sucking leeches. They can be, right? I mean, we've all heard, you know, these stories and stuff like that. Um, so it depends on who's paying them. I, I contracted for a five unit for $250,000. Clearly this was a while ago. It wasn't just yesterday. Um, there were inspection issues. I found out that the seller was lying about a lot of things. The seller was an attorney. 
Um, so every time I turned around, there was something else that he had said in the paperwork that wasn't true. Well, nowadays, I would just say, well, who's trusting his numbers anyway? Do your own due diligence. I've heard John say that a dozen times. Do your own due diligence. Only pay based on your own due diligence, not on the seller's numbers. But this was a long time ago, and I wasn't confident. This was a big transaction for me. It was a quarter of a million dollars. That was a lot of money back then, okay? So I walked away. I asked for my deposit back. He refused to give it to me. He ended up with half the deposit, okay. The next buyer bought it a couple months later, six months later, whatever. They rehabbed all the problems, and they sold it for 450. So the lesson there is do your own due diligence, trust your own numbers, don't let emotion like, this guy's a scumbag. Like, this is pissing me off. Don't let that get in the way. Let your own knowledge and your own research, don't let emotion get in the way of it. That's the lesson on that. That's, that's one objection I get. It's like, basically, what do they call it? Tripping over a dollar to pick up a penny? Mm -hmm. I have people, you know, hey, I seen the house sell back then, and he only bought it for this much. He's making 200 grand. Right. Well, well, he bought it at the right time. He bought it at the right time. He did yeah, all the repairs. He did, the work, he did whatever. He did your yeah. purpose you're buying it for is to make it an asset for yourself. Right. Don't worry. It's not how much he makes. It right. not, uh, doesn't have nothing Look, to do Look, 20 years in the future, it won't matter whether you paid 250 for it or 450 yeah, a year right. later, because that 450 was probably a year later, yeah. okay? It won't matter 20 years in the future. So stick with your own numbers. I don't recommend buying negative cash flow, however. I strongly don't recommend that, especially before a recession. <laughs> so, okay. There, that's it. I screwed up a lot, and I could talk for hours about 10 more mistakes. Question? Anybody? No? So, I would like to go around the room and just, if you guys have run into a problem, and in your past of real estate investing, who owns the property, who owns the mortgage? Any mistakes you've made or whatever, if you wanna throw them out there, I'd be more than happy. You know, just it's good learning experience. And two, if you're like looking for a deal, specific deal right now, or some kind of financing right now, um, definitely put that out there too. And obviously introduce yourself uh, before you can. So, does anyone, like I'll, I'll start actually. My, so the reason there was a break in my investment is because I did four flips in, in a condo conversion at the same time, uh, which is not really smart to do, especially when you don't know anything about it. All four and the condo conversion all, all at the same, the same time. time. When you first started. When I first started. Because you didn't know that you were well, didn't know I went, enough I went at to, that point. I went what about the action, right? No, I went to Guru. I went to a Guru. Of course you did. This is the <laughs> system. You can do this system. You can do as many properties at one time. So here I'm thinking just buy, buy, buy. And it was all REOs back then. So I'm like, you know, hell yeah, this is exactly what he showed us to do. Well, I learned from, I don't know if you know Armando Montalago. Oh, mm -hmm. very well. Do you really? <laughs> So I, I learned from him, but it was all Arizona and He's California. part of the reason that Black Diamond was anti-guru. Oh, really? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so he, uh, I tried to apply his construction prices to New England. And they tried to say, oh, no, it's the same every, everywhere. It's the same everywhere. It's not the same everywhere. When you deal with a contractor, you got to think about it like this. How much do I have to pay him to get him to do what I want to do? And it's different, it's always different for everyone else. So, um, you know, the, the numbers are what the guy tells you the numbers are, that's it. So anyways, I over, I under budgeted for that my last flip severely. Um, it was a large house, it was a weird house. Uh, so not only was it a large house, but being the weird house on the street, no one kind of wants that house, it's a white elephant. You know, it's rare, so it's worth much, and then you have it, and it's not really worth that. It's only much. worth money if somebody wants it. Right. So, so I bought the the weird house on the street. It was a French architect who built like wings. Uh, it was a, actually it came out nice. I really liked it, but because of the under budgeting, I couldn't finish it on par. It was in Dedo. The finishes weren't on par with what the market finishes were in Dedo, 
and I couldn't sell it for what I, my ARV was based off those properties. And I couldn't sell it for that price because it wasn't worth that price. So now I'm stuck. Um, you know, I'm out of making mortgage payments now. Um, I'm in it too deep and I can't sell it for what I need to do. So I'm like, I need to get out of it somehow. So I'm like, all right, short sale. Well, the contractor I hired was a handshake. I was like, all right, man, you help me, I'll help you, right? It's not a, an agreement. You must have an agreement. Well, all said and done, he wanted to take me to court saying that I owed him eight grand. Actually, I owed him like 20 something grand. The guy was never there. He never did anything. Like, I did the work. And he said he was. I was working under him and that uh, he was owed 20 grand. So that, that being one of the elements, I tried the short sale. I needed everyone that was in on the lien. He put a lien on my property to sell for a certain amount of money to get out of the problem. He was the one problem that wouldn't let me short sale. And um, I had to foreclose on the property, but I did an LLC. I told the hard money lender, I said, hey, you gotta take it over. I'm done, I'm checked out. I, got, I can't sell it for what I need to to get out of it. And so I foreclosed on that property and then still went to court and battled him. Finally got to settle out of it. Did he have a lien on the property? He had a lien, yeah. He put a lien later, just before, you know. Once he realized we were selling, he was slapping on there. Why couldn't you rent it? That's one of my mistakes. I wish I tried. I wish I tried to rent it. Because you never know. Because if, say you're stuck in that hard money loan, how you do hard money, and you can still make the payment, and it's off the rent, or even if it's taking a little bit out of your pocket, you know, just hanging in there a little bit more. and and a little bit longer might might be the difference. The market might come up that much more. And that's true for East Boston. I did a condo conversion. I bought it at like 450 and needed a full gut job. If you bought that property now, if I held on to it and rented those condos, it would be worth yeah. shit. It'd be one you might have had to buff and buff it again, but. I would have been 1.5 million on a $400,000 yeah. purchase. You know, on a $200,000 repair, I convinced the contractor who had a full-time job to do a gut renovation on a three family for $200,000, which is like unheard of. So you live, you learn, you know, and now, but now I know what's going on. So now when I see a property, it's just apparent to me, hey, we need to do this, we need to do this, put this in the memory. And that's how it is. Yeah, pretty soon it becomes obvious when you yeah. look at enough properties. Yeah, now it's, yeah. yeah, so. But it was a hard, hard mistake to make, man. Hard pill to swallow, for sure. Thank God I did an LLC. Always do everything in the LLC. Always. Yeah, but you didn't screw over your lender either. You were honest with no, me. You I told, told him what was going on. I said, hey, yeah. this is the deal. He goes in, so he's in 70% loan of value. Yeah. He goes in, he puts- To ARV or to purchase? To ARV. Mm -hmm. He goes in, he puts hardwood floors, sells it for like 40 grand more than what my ARV was. What did you have in for? Uh, I had like carpet in the basement and he had put like hardwood. And that's all it took. That's all it took. <laughs> <laughs> that really pissed you off, didn't like, it? Because <laughs> the upstairs was absolutely gorgeous. Because he just was more experienced than you. Yeah, he was just more experienced. Yeah. 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 Okay, so that was your first. He wanted me to pay a lien though. He said, you paid a lien, I'll take the property. So, I, don't, I don't have no money to pay the lien. <laughs> so I just kind of, I say, hey, this is where we go our separate ways. And uh, he made it happen, good for him, he deserved it, you know, so. Now, the personal investor that I used, now you have to make the phone call, because I combined the hard money with the personal investor. So you had no skin in the game? I had no skin in the oh. game. <laughs> so now, she's in it for 100, 100 grand plus, and you gotta make the phone call that you don't wanna make. It's, that was hey, your down payment for I you? Lost I know you're in retirement right now, but I lost you $130,000. And that is not a fun phone call to me. And she had actually had three deals going on because we were all trained with Armando and we had all used the same system and she had lost 130,000 on each property. Wow. I'm assuming he's not getting Christmas cards. No, <laughs> yeah, so, and there was a big lawsuit against him later. There's actually a guy I think that lost his, took his own life because 
But there was a whole bunch of us that failed because we were taught wrong, you know? We learned in the wrong geographical position. So, um, still paying her back to this day. I could pay her back and forth if I wanted to right now, but the cash flow is enough to, to All right, pay so her back. Alright, so you didn't screw her, and your lender didn't I get said, screwed, hey, and your private lender didn't I get said, screwed. I said, we're gonna pay back every penny we promise. That yeah. is what it is, it sucks. You knew a risk, you knew it was a risk going in, you know, but the other two, see you later. So I think that's an important piece too. It's uh, banks and apartment lenders too. Like we want you to make that phone call to us so we know because yeah, we'll you if think, there's a way yeah, we'll what? we'll avoid taking over a property at all costs. We will work something out. With Absolutely, you. no problem. And that whole loan to own thing. If it, who's heard of loan to own? Who's heard of lenders that want to take the they make the loan so that they can take the property back? Most lenders, including hard money lenders, don't want to do that. Now, this guy, well, he didn't even want to do it. it he wanted conquest, to... conquest capital. Oh, well, that explains it. <laughs> 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 and they and they charge you, you know, interest on the whole. Yeah, I, 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 the yeah, whole time. yeah, you don't, don't uh, have, yeah. 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 Make sure you tell but everybody I was naive. to stay I away know. from them. Yeah. You know, I didn't know. I was I just know. so hard money. Yeah, yeah. and everybody gets know. painted with the same brush, so. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's, there's lenders that are out there that are loan to own that they want you so that they can take your property back and most make more money. But most of them are not, and the banks are not. Because nobody wants to go through that. It's too much, for one thing, I'm being lazy. I'm lending because it's easier than owning property. I don't want to take it back. I mean, what a pain in the ass that is. I want you to find another way, and if I can tell you another way, I will, but I don't always know you. But banks definitely don't want to. They'll 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 work with you as long as you've been honest and making the payments and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? I did a stint in uh, managed assets at the bank. Um, the amount of modifications and <laughs> what is Ryan, right? Ryan, yeah. Do you, yeah. you run hard money too, or uh, like all my personal stuff? Yeah, like how I'm do you bank the project? Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, but if if I can go conventional, or if we can go conventional. We'll go conventional but there's times and situations where you have to go hard money and that's what it takes to get the deal done that's what it takes especially for like the construction loans right now like it's tough to get a construction loan right now from a traditional bank right. it's like next to impossible it turned around because it used to be easy yeah it's now it's now it's hard next to, to impossible even if you're a seasoned you yeah. know, you're in construction it's your career it's yeah. very very challenging uh, but it all depends i mean i mean a lot of my stuff recently like on the bank side has been me taking hard money lenders out. So last last week we reached refinance the guy from eleven percent down to six percent. He rehabbed a four unit or a roll and paid out with two hundred thousand dollars cash. Um, so you know we're still doing seventy five percent L T V so we can do that stuff but it all depends on the project. So yeah. Yeah be honest and get yeah, a lot we'll, more help. We'll work with you. Yeah. Like I know it's the phone gets heavy when you need to make those calls for sure, but like I said, the banks do not want to take these things over. They're in the business of risk. Yes. You know what I mean? They, they don't want to build houses, and if you flip That's whatever, right. you, you know, and you and you were project manager on that flip, you know how stressful it is, yeah. and it takes a lot of time and energy. They they base their money on risk, and that's what they want. They want their money to make money. Well, it's why we're cash flow lenders, not collateral lenders. So like, you know, the collateral component for banks doesn't pay the loans, it's the cash flow that does. So right. that's why we do all the GSCR products. Yeah. And if you can get conventional, get conventional. Yes. Never go hard money if you can get conventional. The only exception to that is if you don't have time, like you've got to, you know, it's absent. Because everybody says, well, you have to close in 30 days. It doesn't necessarily mean it's so. But if you truly have a killer deal and they have, and you have to close it, a week or two weeks or something like that and that's and the, that then use hard money if you have to but other than that if you can get conventional yeah. get conventional and like people sometimes think they need to go hard money because they want to put less down like you know that's, yeah wow well, that's not like, not after they call me they won't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh yeah I mean, only here, if you're super experienced yeah, yeah we hear some yeah we hear some well, but in most cases 
it's because they don't have the ex excess capital to right. go conventional. Well, because so, the gurus tell everybody, oh, you can get, they'll yeah. fund 100%, you can get 100% yeah, exactly. funding. Yeah. Yep. Our Wando taught you that, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I will tell you though, the financial mistake that I made, the amount, what I learned, I probably, uh, probably tripled, quadrupled what I lost um, in equity with my new purchases. So, you know, it's a big lesson to learn, but at the same time, you can't pay for that education, you know, and you just come out that much stronger. So, you're gonna make mistakes, man. It is, that's how you're gonna learn. It sucks, but, you know, it'll come back tenfold down the, down the road, trust me. If you stick with it. If you stick with it, if you don't right. quit. Right, and don't sell it like I did down in, I mean, that was still the right decision for me, but don't just like, oh shit, let me sell this and get out and I'm, yeah, no, keep yeah. going. Well, it's important for getting in the exit strategies too. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you almost have to think past beyond the end before you think about the beginning too. So. Yeah, and I would think nowadays it's a little bit easier too because obviously with these networking groups and things like that where if you find yourself getting stuck in a deal you bring that to a group like this and more than likely someone in that room can more than likely solve that problem right they can pick it apart for you and come up with a solution yeah. even if the solution sucked yep for example john was like i sold a property to a client and they got into a full family and they didn't know that they wanted to be landlords anymore really quickly and john came in and he's like, look, I'll buy your house because he was building portfolio gardener. And then you can take your money and put it in one of my syndications and you won't even have to think about it. You know what I mean? So, you know, being part of this networking is yeah. huge. You don't know who can offer what to you. And now he owns half the gardener. And now he, and now he <laughs> bought gardener, so. <laughs> and one of the great things about like this, instead of sitting in a room with a speaker and everybody's in rows of chairs, is, is actually talking about deals, just like I talked about this kind of stuff, is talking about some, hey, I got a problem. Gal used to do this format, and Josh and I were saying, I said, hey, I love that format. Because it's not, you get to know people sitting in the room. Right, Gal's usually good. And Mike, Ketchum does it too, a little so, bit yeah, about the round robin and yeah. who you are and what you're looking for. Yeah, so yeah I just don't yeah. go to Derry very much. He's, he's usually here, he usually makes it. I think his meeting conflicts with something else like that. Oh, could be. There was another real estate event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's another real estate guru. There's another one. In, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a smaller one, but there's another one. Mm -hmm. Tonight, some entitled was supposed to be here. Yeah. Oh. Anybody else got some stories? Like, I want to hear. Some stuff. Uh, I mean, I guess I'll. I know Aaron yeah. has stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we we found this nine family in Newmarket, and when I say we, it's me and a few partners, and um, we ended up closing on the deal, um, and it had we took it over because there was some problem headed there, and the landlord was um, kind of wanted to retire and just didn't feel like dealing with these tenants anymore. So, you know, we had had experience in evicting tenants prior, and um, we looked for like value add properties, and this needed work too. So we thought, oh, okay, no problem, we'll get in, do it. So. Um, we ended up getting the tenants out and all was well. We started renovating the units and um, the rents that we were collecting were actually supplementing the construction costs that we were doing on um, on the, the property. So it was like kind of like a break even. So everything's going well. We finish all the renovations. We get this thing fully fit up, fully, fully leased. And, our rent roll went from six thousand dollars a month on the entire property all the way up to over eleven grand. Right. Wow. So huge, 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 huge deal for us. So I come back home from Aruba on, on a Sunday and I get a call from uh, one of the first floor tenants and he's like, "Hey Ryan, um, I don't know what's going on, but there is water pouring out of my ceiling fan." <laughs> so uh, I immediately shoot up to. Are you guys familiar with New Market, New Hampshire? Mm -hmm. So New Market, New Hampshire is probably like a 25 minute ride from my house. Shoot up there and um, I'm like, what the, heck, what the heck's going on? There is water that sounded like Niagara Falls in 
the unit to the side where we have a tenant moving in that Monday. So that morning, um, I, I go in there, we immediately find the water, shut it off, and I run upstairs and the third floor tenant had cracked the pipe that le led to his toilet and he cracked it in the floor. And How did he do that? He was turning and like shutting the water off after he was using the bathroom, I guess. And it just got to a point where it just snapped. Yeah. Yeah. So broke into the floor. He's like, hey, thank you for coming. Like, this is really bad. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, so we had to renovate five units all over again. So we ended up not going through insurance, honestly. We had contractors there like around the clock. We had to end up paying them like almost double just to get them to like get our tenants and get that done as quick as possible so we can get the tenants back in there to make it livable again. So it, it had, we ended up turning around in three weeks and it costed us about 13 grand. Uh, we probably would have got more money if we did claim insurance, but we elected not to because it was more important for us to place the tenants back in there. Plus, we had, you know, it was six months into it, so we had just had a policy put on. I mean, not just, but we were also running the risk of, you know, insurance companies can drop you for a simple claim like that, especially that early. So we didn't want that to happen either. We didn't want to run the risk because, again, this isn't our first property. We had multiples with this agency as well, too. So, um, you know, it, it ended up all working out in the end. But yeah, two renovations um, and just a lot learned, honestly. Short period of time, so um, yeah, we had another one where in, in Manchester, a six unit that uh, the the furnaces blew out. Similar situation to you. They said it was fine. Um, inspection report. It lasted maybe four months. Blew out. We had to buy space heaters for all six units. Uh, we had to pay someone thirty thousand dollars to get the furnaces or the the tankless stuff put back in. And, uh, you know, it was again emergency work, so um, but it all panned out. That was done in about three weeks as well, too. So, and that was emergency round the clock stuff, too. So, um, yeah, it's an expensive year, so it's all good. Wow, yeah, that shit happens. Yeah, I mean, why do you have your capex? Why do you have your repair budget? Exactly, why build those reserves reserves, percentages, um, and again, like this stuff can also happen in your own house, you know? And I think that's mm -hmm. what a lot of people say. It's like, oh, I don't wanna get into real estate, I don't wanna be a landlord, I don't wanna deal with stuff. It's like, you can deal with that stuff in your own house too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it happens. That's why we do it. Yeah, and not, not having capital expenditure budget when you buy a property is another one of the mistakes that I made too, which is why I couldn't afford to do more stuff at once because I didn't have that built into my into my budget. And, and just to tie